Good morning and welcome to Bible class today. I don't know where you intended to be. Yes, sir. Am I supposed to sit down? Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Before I sit down, I want to say a few words. I, I didn't have an opportunity in church. I didn't have an opportunity doing fellowship. But I just, uh, to this small group, and you can share it with other people, I'm L.B. Spencer, and I'm the one that the, the goodbye was for. You can't hear me? No. Don't hear a thing back here. Oh. Turn up your hearing aids. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is just going to the uh, okay. camera. Yeah, just recording you. Yeah. Uh, I just want to thank the church. I've been here five years, and we moved here because my wife was ill, and my family was here. Uh, was here, my daughter, and um, but the church has meant a whole lot to me during this time and I definitely want to thank uh, Anita and Bob uh, for helping me because uh, not only was my wife sick but we also went through COVID at that time and uh, Bob is and Anita are both are one of those quiet people that work behind the scenes and you'll never know it and um, unless somebody like me speaks up and, and tells you but Bob almost every week would go to the grocery store during COVID and pick up my groceries for me and bring them to the house. And, uh, and uh, it wasn't, and he was always one that, and Anita would always say, what can we do for you? What can we do for you? And uh, so I just really want to thank Bob and, and Anita publicly for what they've done for me and my wife. And, and uh, reaching out to me and sharing uh, stories with me and and, and building that uh, that bond between us and I appreciate that. The other thing that I wanted to say about this church is that this is a, a, a church of action. Uh, you know, it's not only a church that talks the talk, but it puts it into action. And, uh, you know, I look back at what all this church has done for me and for the community and reaching out to the community that all the great things that, that has been done. And, and I also want to thank uh, Jeff. Uh, when, <laughs> during my grieving time, uh, which I think is almost over until today. <laughs> Jeff and Bob would would take me to breakfast and lunch, and and we would share a lot. And, and uh, one of the things about Jeff I want to mention, he, he's an excellent preacher. Uh, preaches the Word of God. It, it's all about the Bible. What does the Bible say? Not what people. Uh, think the Bible says, but what the Bible actually says. But not only is he a great preacher or teacher, uh, he's also a great counselor. And, uh, and he helped me uh, during this time of grief and, and, and things. So, and the, the third thing I want to talk about is the youth here. Uh, it's just and I wish they were here, but they've been such a strong example for me and such a rewarding to watch the youth grow in, in this church. And, and I'm thankful for the, the parents and the grandparents that have set such a strong example for the youth to follow, you know, as to what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to be a, a Christian family? What does it mean to be a Christian husband and wife? What does it mean to be a Christian grandparent? And, uh, and you all have set just a, a, a extreme, extremely positive Christian example for you. And now that uh, the Sunday school is over with, let's go ahead and have a prayer. <laughs> you can pray if you'd like to. 
Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, LV. For those of you that do not know LV very well, he's, uh, he's really quite a very interesting guy. I've gotten to know him quite well over the years, but he is uh, headed back to his hometown of uh, Morristown, Indiana. And uh, he's made a few trips out there to see old friends and family. And uh, he's purchased a new home, or a home out there. He currently lives in uh, Landis Homes, uh, so he's going to be leaving this week. This is his last week, and he'll be going back and going back to his old home church. He and his wife were very involved in India missions over the years, made several trips to India. So he's got quite a legacy himself, and we wish you the very best, LV. So, uh, as you know, there are two classes offered today. If you were looking for the class on gender, that's over in the auditorium. And we talked about this. I said, if you don't mind, I'd prefer teaching about Israel. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that I love about this congregation. Uh, but one of the things uh, that I love is the effort that goes in to planning uh, Bible classes. Uh, our elders uh, and, and staff have worked on this all the time. They set out a four years plan. And uh, today's a good example. They always try to offer a diversity. Uh, we have lots of uh, topical classes. Uh, we have lots of New Testament book classes. And we also get into some of the Old Testament. But for those of you who don't know, we actually have a team of members that work on that. And I'll just tell you who they are. It's Jeff, Emily Brandon, Paul Florio, Danny DeLeon, Julie Smith, John Toy, and Holly Warren. Kind of a cross-section of the congregation that gets together at the beginning of the year and say, let's lay out an education plan for, for Bible classes. So uh, it's as a result of that work, and I, I had coffee with Jeff this week, and he said this year has worked out amazingly well because what, quite, ha quite often what happens as you go through the year is someone has vacation come up or something changes and you have to try to plug uh, classes in. But he said this year has gone pretty much according to plan. Uh, so this class is going to focus on some lessons from the Old Testament. I got a call actually from Jeff uh, in the early part of the year and said, would you be willing to teach a class this year and just use something that you've done before? So that's not a lot of work. So back in 2000, I think it was 2012 or 2014, I taught a 12-week class in the auditorium on First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. So um, I guess it's probably about February. I pulled out my notes from that time and started reading through them and reading more scripture. And I decided I did not want to use that just solely as the class. So I, and the more I read and the more I studied, I said, I think we need to tell the whole story of the nation of Israel. Um, it's a fascinating story, a fascinating story when you follow how God has dealt with the Jewish people from the very beginning. Um, you see the title, it's Stories of Rebellion, Failure, Renewal. It's a story of tragedy, disappointment, enlightenment, and uh, it's just a great, great story. And I'm going to guess, that, do you, anybody here consider yourself a pretty good Old Testament student of the Old Testament? <laughs> yeah, I see. Not too many people do. Uh, being in the Church of Christ, along with a lot of other churches that came out of the Restoration Movement, the Christian Church, Churches of Christ, we call ourselves a New Testament church. And that's really based upon the fact that our foundation is based upon the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus and the teachings of Paul and all of those things that occur in the New Testament. And sometimes we do that at the neglect of studying the Old Testament. So today I want us to start our study of the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament, by looking at the New Testament. So take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If somebody would like to read the first 13 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 
just to remind you, uh, this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He wrote them two letters. And we actually think there may have been more letters that we do not have copies of or do not have any reference to. But we know at least the two that we have are written by Paul. So he's writing to the church at Corinth. And here's what he says. So who would like to read that for me? Okay, fine. Go ahead. <clears throat> nice and loud. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate and the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from the spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for their dead bodies were spread out in the wilderness. Now these things happen as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they indeed crave them. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, <coughs> as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. <coughs> Nor are we to commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor are we to put the Lord to the test as some of them did, and were killed by snakes nor grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the end of the age, the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands, stands watch out that he does not fall. No temptation has ever taken you except <coughs> something common to mankind, and God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond that you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of what happened to your forefathers. The conduct they had, the things they did, the evil they did, the idols they worshipped, we do not want you doing those things. Those things are written down as examples so we don't do that. So that passage applies to us today when we go into this study. When we see what the nation of uh, Israel did, we're going to see those as examples of things that we should not do. Jeff jokingly said when he saw the title, so are you suggesting that the Jews were rebellious? And the answer is yes. And, and I jokingly said, but we're a lot better than that. Well, the fact of the matter is, we aren't. We're the same kind of people. So we're going to take a look at that. Someone said, those who do not remember the past are, uh, are condemned to repeat it. I happen to be uh, a history buff. I don't know if you are or not. But there are so many lessons in history, uh, the history of our country. Um, uh, there are just so many things that we can learn from history. But I think the most valuable lessons are the things we learn from the history of the Jewish people. So we say, why do we just study the Old Testament? Uh, one of the things that you'll find in my classes, I use a lot of PowerPoint, because I was told years ago as a teacher that if people hear something, they only remember it about 15% of the time. If they hear it and see it, that goes up to about 50%. So maybe you'll see something and hear something that maybe you'll remember. So the Old Testament really lays down the foundation for teaching. A lot of the things we see in the New Testament, the basis was laid for that in the Old Testament. Numerous lessons throughout the Old Testament, character studies of things that, uh, to serve us for all generations. It's going, to, it's going to give us a great insight into the character of mankind. And as I said earlier, uh, you're going to see what the character of the Jewish people were. And if you look at us, you're going to see that we have some of those same characteristics. Um, also, the Old Testament offers great insight into the character of God. In the New Testament church, uh, in, in, in uh, the restoration kinds of churches, and we get into the New Testament, we see that uh, you don't see a lot of discussions or conversations from God. Uh, obviously when Jesus came and then the Holy Spirit. So you get into the New Testament, you see the other two characters from the, the Trinity, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Not so much about God. We learn more about God by going through the Old Testament. And the other thing that you're going to learn from this lesson, it's, va it's, it's so important to faithfully love and follow the God that we love. So those are some of the things, 
So what does it teach us about God? What are we going to learn about God? First off, you're going to find out that God loves all the people He created. Loves all of them. We find throughout the Old Testament, regardless of the circumstances, if they were faithful, God provided for everything they needed. This is the key thing. God knows the heart of the people. He knew the heart of the Jewish people. And the thing that is maybe a little bit scary is He knows my heart too. Regardless of what I might be on the outside, God knows what my heart is. He knew the heart of the Jewish people. And He was willing to punish the people when they disobeyed. But He was also willing to forgive them if they came and asked for forgiveness. And you're going to see that throughout, these, uh, throughout this study that they disobeyed and God would forgive them, give them another chance. But He's always willing to forgive them. So if there's a lesson that comes out of this, it's, I believe it's this. Mankind has always been disobedient, and yet God has always been patient and faithful and will always forgive if we are making an effort to follow Him. If we are making an effort, He will forgive us of our sins, just like He did the Israelites. So here's kind of the layout of what we're going to try to do. We've got six, we've got six classes. Today is going to be primarily an introduction uh, and background. We're going to give you a little quick snapshot of the Old Testament. Uh, and then next week we're going to talk about uh, David and Solomon. Now. I don't know, I, maybe all of you know this, when, when there were kings, there were only three kings of the United Kingdom. Do you know who they were? Saul, Saul David, and Solomon. They were the only three kings over the United Kingdom. We're not going to spend a lot of time on Saul, but we are going to focus on the life of David and Solomon. And then, uh, lesson three, we're going to talk about the building of the temple and Solomon's house. What went into that? How important that was for the Jewish people, the, the having the temple there. And then we're going to see, and we get into lesson four, what happens. Uh, they're in their days of glory, and all of a th sudden things start crumbling down. And we're going to find out that the nation splits, and you sp there's a split into two sections. Israel is going to be the northern kingdom. It's called a northern kingdom. And Judah is in the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, there, do you remember how many tribes there were of Israel? Ten. There were 12 tribes total. A total of 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on. But 10 of those are in Israel, the northern kingdom. Only two are in the southern kingdom called Judah. But both of them, when they, when they collapsed and fell apart, that caused other problems, and they both were taken into exile. Uh, Israel's taken into exile in Assyria, and Judah is later on, several hundred years later, taken uh, into Babylonia. A wonderful, amazing st the story of Judah uh, and going into Babylon is just an amazing story. But God promised them, if you are making an effort to be what I want you to be, I'm going to allow you to return from exile. So it's called the return from exile, lesson five. And then uh, when you take a look at this study uh, of the Old Testament, there are several books written by prophets. And we're going to take a look at all the prophets uh, in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, where they prophesied. But I want to take a, a little time and focus on just two, because they're probably two of the most well known, and that's Elijah and Elisha. So here's, here's, here's the thing I want you to do. Bring your Bibles to class. We're going to study Scripture the old-fashioned way we're going to study Scripture. So throughout this class, we're going to be looking at a lot of, a lot of different Scriptures. See uh, what, the, as LV said, Jeff preaches what the Bible says. We're going to see what the Bible says about these things. So a little Old Testament refresher. Uh, I have kind of a, an engineering mind. I tend to think of things in linear ways. And so I like timelines. I like, so where does this fit in timeline? So if you take a look at the Old Testament, first of, 
of course, we know everything started with creation. Then we run into the period of the patriarchs. What is a patriarch? Leader of a tribe, a nation, a family. Generally a leader, a fatherly leader. Can you tell me any of the patriarchs when you think of the Old Testament? Who were some of the patriarchs? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were patriarchs. So we ended this period where God is allowing patriarchs to be the leader of the nation. And then, of course, we know what happens. Uh, we have this great famine. Uh, Jacob sends his, uh, his family to Egypt, and they're captive there for about how many years? Do you remember? 400. About 400 years. There's, there's, there's some discussion on that. There's, if you look at the two passages, there's actually one says 400 and one says 430. But anyway, they're in Egypt for about 400 years. They're introduced to worshiping false gods. Uh, but God in His grace and benevolence delivers them. And who did He, who did he pick to lead them out of the Egypt? Moses. Well, they had Moses. Okay, so Moses leads them out. And He had promised them a special land, a land of their own. It's called the land of Canaan. And so we've taken you out of Exodus. They, they meandered through the desert for 40 years, did some really stupid things. God was still faithful to them. Uh, but He's still going to give them this land. Now, do you remember who might have led this conquest? Joshua. 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 If you read the book of Joshua, uh, it tells the whole story of how God guided them through conquering this land. So they have their own land, uh, just as He's promised. So in order to kind of oversee them, God allowed some judges. Do you know anything about the judges? Can you name any of the judges? Samuel, Samuel Gideon, Deborah. So he put in, he put in judges, and what were their purpose? To kind of help govern all these people. There had to be some structure of governing them. So the judges did that. Um, and there were 12 of them. But God knows I said, God knows the heart. God knows that that's not going to be sufficient. He knows they're going to want a king. So we're going to look at three passages now that talk about this. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 35, 11, all the way back in the book of Genesis. Thirty-five, eleven, and, and God said to Jacob, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I give to Abraham, I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from there, from him at that place where he had talked with him. So even in the book of Genesis, when God is talking to Jacob, he knows that out of this nation of Israelites there were going to be kings that arise. Now then jump over to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Uh, verses 14 and 15. So the book of Deuteronomy tells us, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and say, let us set a king over us like all the other nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them, for the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. And this goes on and on. So in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, when you ask for a king, there's certain criteria about who this king should be. First of all, it should not be a foreigner. It should come from the, the Israel. You can't select a foreigner to oversee the Israelite nation. So 
take your Bibles now and let's go over to 1 Samuel. So here's what God said is going to happen, that they're going to ask for a king. So beginning uh, in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, um, Samuel is very prominent uh, through the Old Testament. He was, he was a priest, very involved uh, in, in selecting the, the kings and so forth. So when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn born was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have." So they're, they're, they're just like uh, it said earlier, just like all the other nations, that's exactly what, everybody else has got a king. Why don't we have a king? But, the, but when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. So you tell them, if, if you're going to give them a king, that's okay, but give them a, a heads up warning. Here's what the king's going to do. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equip for equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and, your, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you've chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone go back to his town. So all that we would read there in Genesis and Deuteronomy about here's what they were going to do, they said, okay, we want a king like everybody. And so God says, will you tell them what the king's going to do? It's not going to be perfect under a king. And we're going to see as we study this that what uh, Samuel says is going to happen is exactly what happens when these kings, when these kings uh, come on board. Um, why didn't God, why did not, why did God not want them to have a king? Because he was the king. He was the king. He wanted, he wanted them to serve him, not some intermediary. God says, I want to be your king, but if you want an earthly king, I'm going to give in and let you do that. And just like uh, this said, ever since they left Egypt, they have disobeyed and worshiped other gods. They've been a disobedient people. Um, so as we move forward, we're th our study is going to be primarily in these six books. So we talked about the judges. Now here is where they, they get the kings and then they go into exile and then the return. So we're going to be looking primarily at these uh, books. Um, 
First and Second Samuel. Uh, in fact, if, if we were to continue reading here, we will find out that Samuel now goes out and helps select the first king, Saul. So Samuel talks about up through Saul. When we get into kings, we get into David and to uh, Solomon. So uh, kind of time frame again. After the exodus of Egypt, they get into the, con into the Promised Land. God had to be governed by judges. He knows their hearts. He knows they would not be satisfied. We just read these passages. <clears throat> so we want to find out that uh, they flourish for a while. They turn their back on God. God allows them to um, be taken captive, and but He delivers them. So if we take a look at these books, uh, we have them in our Bibles as First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. Originally, when they were written in Hebrew, they were one book. But when they translated them from Hebrew to Greek, they could not fit everything on one scroll. So in the Greek, it's on more than one scroll. So we ended up in when we put when the canon was put together, we end up with with two books. Is, is that because they had to use more words? In Greek to describe one Hebrew word? I knew you want to ask that question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't know if it was more words or bigger words or exactly why that is, but I don't know. I'm not a language person, so I can't tell you. <laughs> Jeremiah is a wonderful book. All of these books are great books. But if you, read, uh, if you read through Jeremiah, it's just a, it's a wonderful book. He was a prophet. He's going to be a prophet to the southern nation of Judah. And then Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, we're going to read about that. After the years of Babylon, Ezra and Nehemiah help come back and lead people back and help rebuild the temple, which is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. So if we kind of compare these books... This is when they were written, First and Second Samuel written uh, first. It goes from the end of Judges through the King Saul and part of King David over the United Kingdom. First and Second Kings gets into Solomon's reign and where the, where it, in the nation ends up being divided. Uh, and then First and Second Chronicles. You're, if you were to compare these two books, there's a lot of the same information in both of these books, but they kind of give it to you from a little bit different perspective. Uh, so the purpose of Samuel was to uh, illustrate God's blessing on the faithful and the disastrous consequences of David's sin and God's mercy, and, uh, and we know that David replant, repents. So uh, again, Kings is going to talk about the uh, exile, and Chronicles is encouraging the people as they return. So uh, just to make a long story short, the people get their kings. And what you're going to find when we go through this, we're going to look at some of the kings, not all of them. Uh, the ten, uh, ten tribes, Israel, there was not a single decent king in Israel. Judah had some kings. Some tried their best to get the people to return back to God. But Israel, none of the kings uh, were, were very good kings. So the only people that were listening were the prophets. Uh, so again, we just talked about this uh, falling apart. So, how much time do we have? Okay, we got time. Take your Bibles and turn to Second Samuel 24. This is a very interesting story, and it's important in uh, in the overall story here. I didn't know if we'd have time to dig into this or not. So, the Second Samuel 24, there's a parallel passage in, in First Chronicles 21. So, this is really called, we know about David's sin with Bathsheba, and we'll look at that, a little bit of that next week. But there's another sin that David commits that has significant uh, long-term consequences for the nation of Israel. So beginning in verse 24, I mean chapter 24, 
Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against him, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. Remember, now the, the nation's still united. So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, Go throughout the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and enroll the fighting men, so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over, and may the eyes of my lord the king see it. But why does my lord the king want to do such a thing? Now, there's kind of an interesting question here. If you read the, if you read the passage in Chronicles, it said Satan incited David to do this census. Um, and I'm not too sure, sh- there's, there's, there's a lot written about what the problem was here, but he takes this census, even Joab says, I don't think that God wants you to be doing this. Uh, so he's even questioning what they're going to do. Um, but the king's words, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders, so they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. After crossing the Jordan, they camped near Aror, the south of the town in the gorge, and then went through Gad and on to Jazer. They went to Gilead and the region of Tam Hodsai and on to Danjon and uh, around toward Sidon. Then they went toward the fortress of Tyre and all the towns of the Hivites and the, Hivites and the Canaanites. Finally, they went on to Bathsheba in the Negev of Judah. After they had gone through the entire land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days to take this census. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king. In Israel there were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle a sword, and in Judah 500,000. David was conscience-stricken after he had counted the fighting men, and he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. So if you were to perhaps go Google the sin of David and the census, you're going to find various explanation about what was the sin here. Um, there's there's uh, some theologians that believe that when, uh, if you go back, I think it's in the book of Exodus or Deuteronomy, that they were supposed to, uh, to collect a tax for the temple when they did this census. There's no mention of that. So some people say, well, the sin was he didn't collect the tax. I'm not absolutely sure what the sin was, but here's what's important. Um, David was conscience stricken, let me go back, David was conscience stricken after he counted the fighting men, and he said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Here's the interesting part. I almost entitled this, God Gives You Choices. Now watch this. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So God says, you have sinned, and I'm going to get, let you select how you are going to be punished. So Gad went to David and said to him, Shall there come upon you three years of famine in your land? That's the first option. The second option, or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you. Or, number three, three days of plague in your land. Now then, think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. So David's got to think this over. Now which of these punishment options is best? So David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for His mercy is great. But do not let me fall into the hands of my men. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of time designated, and 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity, and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I'm the one who sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall upon me and my family. 
On that day Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When Aruna looked and saw the king and his men coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague on the people may be stopped. Aruna said to David, Let my lord the king take whatever pleases him and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and here are threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. O king Aruna gives all this to the king. Aruna also said to him, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Aruna, No, I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid fifty shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered prayer in behalf of the land, and the plague on Israel stopped. Aside from being an interesting story about God giving him a, a choice of punishments, the important part of this is this piece of land that he buys will become the future site of the temple. So when we get into Solomon building the temple, we're going to find that it's built on this piece of land. And when we get into talking about the temple, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And the what the Jewish people teach is this piece of land that he just purchased is the same place that Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him. It's called Mount Moriah at, at some point in time. It's also the place today where the temple will be built uh, in, in Solomon's time. And I'll show you some pictures when we get into it. Today, this rock is the place of, called the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is controlled by the Muslims. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into talking about the temple and the importance of the temple to the people. But I wanted to share this with you because this is the beginning of buying the land where the temple will be built under David's son Solomon. So any questions at all, comments, thoughts? Nothing. Okay. Next week uh, we are going to go taking a look at uh, David and Solomon. Uh, if you have time, it won't take you very long. If you want to just sit down this, re this, this week and just read First and Second Kings, there's so much in it. I, did, I was telling Carol earlier, about two or three years ago, I, my Bible reading plan, I just decided to start reading First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. There's so many valuable lessons there. So if you have time, uh, read through First and Second Kings. Otherwise, we'll see you here next Sunday morning and talk about David and Solomon.